Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. As we begin day three of a five-day program on the conflict uh, in Ukraine, we all know that the war is now escalating in very dramatic ways, uh, not only uh, between the United States and Russia, but also between the United States and China, uh, which is increasingly uh, getting involved uh, in support of Russia, as uh, are many, many countries in the global south. So the war in Ukraine has catalyzed a global conflict uh, that the world has not seen uh, since uh, the first and second uh, world wars. Uh, the major difference uh, is that we're now dealing with a world of superpowers. And the United States, and Russia, and China have nuclear weapons. Russia and the United States have made it clear that they will use them. And yet we continue to escalate the war. It's a very stark reality that here we are in 2023, when the world is challenged as never before by runaway climate change, that rather than cooperating together, we are in a global conflict between superpowers that is escalating, both in terms of rhetoric and in terms of military escalation, a day by day. So we're in the most dangerous moment uh, in our lifetime. And so Humanity Rising is convening a series of summits uh, on this very grave matter uh, that concerns uh, us all. We started with a overview uh, that was uh, provided by Vladimir Posner uh, on Monday. Uh, yesterday, we heard about the dangers of nuclear war. Although we had technical challenges that uh, we were not able to overcome, so Daniel Ellsberg uh, could not be properly heard. So uh, Dan is going to be joining us uh, in a bit for this session. Uh, and so today, we're really going to look at the costs of war, both at the conventional level and also uh, at the nuclear level. And we're privileged here at Humanity Rising that we're convening this summit and our subsequent summits uh, with Code Pink, uh, one of the most dynamic peace organizations in the world who uh, has been organizing uh, peace protests and manifestations of all kinds around uh, Ukraine as it has uh, since the uh, Iraq war. And so uh, we uh, are convening this with Code Pink because as we do with all the issues that we address in Humanity Rising, uh, we want to look the crisis right in the eye with ruthless, ruthless realism, uh, but always with a view of the opportunities that uh, are inherent uh, in the crises that we face and the opportunity buried in the war in Ukraine is the pathway uh, to peace. And that's what Code Pink uh, and Humanity Rising are seeking to bring to public attention as we escalate day by day into deeper conflict. Before we dive in, uh, we always breathe together at Humanity Rising for those of you that are new. So in a moment, you'll hear the sound of a bell. <clears throat> when you hear the bell, just breathe in slowly for about five and a half seconds. So you'll hear another bell. Then breathe out slowly. We're going to take 10 breaths together. This is conscious, coherent breathing that soothes the soul, animates the mind, and establishes a greater sense of heartful community. So thank you, everyone. Let us breathe together, and then we'll commence our program. 
you, everyone. It's always so good to breathe together. And in the spirit of one breath, I want to welcome uh, Jody Evans, the co-founder of Code Pink, who is co-moderating uh, these summits uh, with me uh, as we proceed. Uh, Jody's had a very busy day yesterday as Code Pink was very active in Washington. Uh, she's brought together uh, three members of her team. Uh, Dan Ellsberg is going to uh, join at some point. Uh, so we're going to have a very dynamic program today, and we'll try to just keep up with the flow. Uh, but Jody, thank you uh, for uh, everything that you do. And I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jim. And thanks for everything you do. And for us who are in the streets all the time, education is the most important part of peace because we must be educated in a world that, in a country for sure, that does not want us to be educated about war. So before we dive into the costs of war, which is um, a pretty, uh, you know, uh, uninspiring conversation because it, it brings us close to what those warmongers don't want us to know. I want to give everyone uh, a, a boost um, and see what the team did last night. And um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Perhaps most important, the company, the committee can help determine the combinations of policies there will be order. and legislation necessary to counter CCP aggression and rebuild America's and the free world's competitive advantages. John McBaster, why don't you pause for a second? You'll be okay. given additional time and we'll take care of this. So uh, there we go. Um, that was Olivia uh, Danucci, who's part of our Code Pink team. She's our Washington DC team member um, who's, whose task is actually to raise up the cost of war for those in Congress. And she probably visits uh, um, Congress members every day, except for the days when she's disrupting. Um, Wei coached her yesterday on what message to bring to this first ever Senate hearing that is literally a warmongering hearing. It's a, it's a literal hearing to create hate and distrust and fear of China. And so it was very important that, um, you know, the first time a Senate hearing had been prime time created by the Republicans. Um, so it was very important for Code Pink to be there and disrupt this. Olivia knew she was going to be arrested. She was nervous all day. Um, she was arrested. She was taken to jail. And she's out. And um, I, I can say that after, you know, wringing her hands with Wei and I, it's, it, I know as someone who disrupts a lot after 100 arrests, it's never an easy thing to do because you have no idea what the backlash is and what's going to happen. And nobody wants to go to jail. It's not a fun experience. So um, that's, you know, what it's been given to us, the only thing we can do, because the media has been told not to talk about peace, because we do rallies and marches, the media has been told not to cover it. The only thing left for us to do is disrupt these warmongering he hearings, and we've done it um, over the 20 years of Code Pink. So I thought I'd give you a little shot in the arm of like, oh, and also, um, Someone in the hearing said, we live in the United States where we have free speech and not, you know, China where they don't. And then they arrested the peace activist. And the chairman of the committee said she would not be arrested. And she was. And Ro Khanna, the Democratic uh, Congress member who was presiding, um, also said that she should not be arrested, but she was and charged. And uh, we have International Women's Day coming up in which she was leading a big action for us of a lot of banner drops. And with this arrest won't be able to, we'll have to find someone else. So just so we know what free speech looks actually looks like in the United States, not so free. So anyway, welcome back. 
Um, and thank you again so much for being here and caring about peace. So, you know, as I said, the warmongers don't want us to know about the cost of war. And I want to remind everyone that um, in the Iraq war, they hid the coffins coming home. The media was not allowed to show them. And a Code Pink activist was so upset because she was finding out about all the wounded coming home and actually meeting them in some, in some of our marches. And it, it, was, it had become something like 75,000 wounded were coming home to the 4,000 killed. And the wounds were horrific, um, the visible ones. Um, you know, another, more soldiers have committed suicide, twice as many soldiers have committed suicide than have died in action. Um, Patricia made, oh, actually that's a year. Um, Patricia made this film called The Ground Truth about the wounded um, because battlefield medicine had improved, but um, they were saving lives and also destroying lives. And um, so I actually went to Washington to try to stop the Iraq war because I knew the cost of war in my own community, which was Watts. I worked with gay members and learned that all of their dads had been in Vietnam and 10 to 20,000 people had been killed in Watts, a kind of inner city war zone. And nobody talked about it in what it was and why it was the result of men coming home from wars. So um, we know the, the costs of the Iraq war and Afghanistan war have been hidden. Uh, they've even been hidden to the taxpayers because those two wars cost $21 trillion. If they're everything that we complain about, all the proposals that Bernie Sanders has before Senate and Congress could be more than paid for by the $21 trillion that was used to destroy Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, at the beginning of the Iraq war, as the bombs were dropping, we tore some clothes, covered them in, in red and carried what looked like dead babies in our arms as we wailed through the halls of Congress. And people were upset with us because we were showing them what really was going to be happening. And we later, put small shoes with little price tags on the outside of them that said the names of the children and where they were killed, what day in the Iraq war and put them outside of the halls of doors of senators who were voting for more money to occupy Iraq. Um, you know, I just wanna bring up Iraq, a sovereign country that we occupied for 20 years and destroyed um, that no one seems to bring up when they're talking about sovereignty around Ukraine. Um, so. I, I've invited three dear friends um, and I wanna start with just Savina Martin. She's a longtime activist and an organizer from Massachusetts. She's an army veteran and over the years has mobilized around the war on drug that's affected homeless men and women in Boston and San Diego. And she's helped and helped to um, take over, you know, have homes where they could come to and be cared for, which is, what we call the peace economy. And um, she's a poverty scholar and is busy pursuing um, a doctoral in development psychology. She's a member of the University of the Poor's Homeless Union and also Eastern Chair of Massachusetts Poor People Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Thank you so much for being with us, Savina. And telling us about the cost of war in our own communities. Thank you so much, Jody, my dear, dear Jody. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you also, Jim, for this framing. Um, just one disclaimer, I am a, a student at Boston University School of Theology. No developmental psychology anymore. <laughs> just wanted to say that I have to correct all that information. The cost of war in our communities, um, what happens when we live in a community where there's a war on the poor constantly, right? Here in the US. Um, let me begin with a, a stark image of um, hitting, looking the crisis of war right in the eye, right? Uh, uh, asking where is our humanity, 
uh, as we live in the midst of abundance. But the image I want to start with right now uh, is disturbing. And it's an image of the screaming of a terrified child. A terrified child in 1972 is a haunting image of the napalm girl. Let's breathe with that. It had become a symbol for the anti-war protests all over the world. And today I wanna to start with an image of something that I am going through in a community of wailing women, I call, are experiencing right now. And it's the, it's the image of a young 13 year old two weeks ago who was gunned down in the community. As a result, they're saying now mistaken identity and gang violence. Well, the young 13 year old was visiting his grandmother from suburban Boston on his way on an early Sunday morning, 11.30 a.m., walking to Burger King and was gunned down multiple times. This little boy was my best friend's, my childhood friend's grandson. We went through the funeral, we talked about the crisis, the ongoing crisis in the community and the fact that how are we gonna you know, be safe in the midst of not only chemical warfare, drug overdose, but gun violence, random gun violence in the community. This was my best friend's grandson. He had his funeral. Now remember, these are the conversations that we must have and continue to have. That's why I'm so glad this platform is here so we can talk about the cost of war and the humanity behind it and how do we get to peace? How do we get to peace? How do we get to peace after the wounds? How do we survive? Well, unfortunately, after the arraignment of the, the perpetrator, my dear friend goes home and she does the unthinkable and her funeral is tomorrow. We are outraged. All of us here should be outraged. We are in a state of emergency and all hands must be on deck. All hands must be on deck. The other day I received a phone call talking about the Boston Emergency Medical Services responded to a series of presumed opioid overdoses. Most of the individuals who were impacted believe that they were using cocaine, says the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Identified, and they identified that in 2010 to 2018, overdoses from stimulants like cocaine increasingly involved opioids. So here they are trying to think this through, right? The bottom line is, the community is being gentrified. And I can remember back in 1968, although I was a child, I still remember after the assassination of our dear Dr. King that the drugs were dumped in the community. Chemical warfare, COINTELPRO, spatial deconcentration, pushing people out of the community, a war on the poor. And this continues to this, this day, their pattern of practice from the policies that they make to kill us in the community so that capitalism can come in 
and do what it always does with the greed of eating up and killing through their death dealing policies, the least, the left out and the so-called lost. We came out of the movement of takeover houses. And yes, as Jody uh, mentioned, uh, the National Union of the Homeless, uh, we held a national campaign in 73 cities, simultaneous actions across the country, taking over abandoned buildings back in 1988, 89 or 1991. It's just so much, right? We're dealing, we're still continuing to deal with the interlocking injustices of poverty, racism, ecological devastation, and the denial of health care, outright uh, um, Christian nationalism and militarism. We can't do one without the other. This is the cost of war, the social and economic cost of war. And I can go through so much. We're all the experts, right? We could talk about the stats. So, and that's all I have to say right now uh, in preparing for my dear friend's funeral. Um, this is the reality of where we're at today and what we're up against. So I thank you for, for inviting me here, Joe. Thank you so much, Sabina. I hope that everybody can just take a few breaths because this is what the media doesn't want us to see. Why are we being distracted from the needs at home, the care that is needed in our own country? Um, and um, when we think about this $21 trillion that was spent on war, it needed to go to the needs of the people. So thank you, Savina, and I'm sorry for your loss. So um, next I wanna, um, there are so many costs of war. <laughs> And I'm so we're just getting a taste of it, but um, it's also a day for feeling. So I encourage everyone just to take a really deep breath. Um, the place at the, where this propaganda comes to us is a concerted um, scientific effort to come into our compassion and our empathy and grab it and then be weaponized for war. And so, um, we he, hear when we're feeling actually, what are the costs of war? We're so used to being denied even the crack into what this actually is because they know if we knew what the costs of war were and if we were actually confronted with them that we would all be in the streets because we would not be allowing this to happen with our tax dollars or in our name. So next I wanna to go to Teddy Ogborn. Um, Teddy has joined us from the environmental movement. He um, is Code Pink's War is Not Green coordinator. And um, they are a climate activist and organizer based in New York City. Um, he's originally from Littleton, Colorado. Um, he's um, educated in comparative literature. Um, and but now he's working um, at the intersection of climate and militarism. He's bringing the costs of war to the planet into the climate movement and educating them. And I'll let him tell you, I'll let him educate you, but he's also been a film festival director and a fencing coach and a film producer and a high school English teacher. And he's in the streets almost every day, uh, organizing and building a movement. So um, please welcome Teddy. Thank you so much, Jody, for that kind introduction. Um, and I just want to thank and uplift Savina again for sharing her stories there. Um, feeling deeply moved and holding that with me now. Um, as Jody mentioned, you know, I, I have um, a, a varied background. Like you said, I'm, I'm educated in, in comparative literature. I didn't study political science or environmental science in college. I'm someone who at a certain point, I read a certain, just a certain number of articles and figures around climate change and how much time that we actually have to address it. And I felt like I really needed to pivot. I, I realized at that moment that our governments, certainly not our corporations, are going to stop this crisis. It doesn't stop until we stop it. Um, and I was fortunate enough when I moved to New York a little over a year ago, 
to begin working with some really powerful climate activists that were also peace activists and had associations and worked with Code Pink. And from then, from them, I, I began to learn about the intersections of, of peace, anti-militarism, and the climate crisis and environmental justice. And I was, at the time, it's, it's funny to look back at it now, at the time I was shocked to see sort of how intertwined these issues are. And I was shocked because it, it's not spoken about that way. Um, sometimes in within sort of both of those movements, right? I mean, I have to talk about them as though they're distinct and they certainly aren't, but um, at least within the climate movement, I quickly realized that there is a huge need for this education, which Jody has really aptly identified. You know, ed education is the most important part of peace work. And, and as she just said again, really aptly, you know, if if we did all have a true understanding of you know what our government is and isn't doing, and we could feel that in its fullness every day, we would be out in the streets constantly. That's what's moving me to the streets. It's moving. That's what's moving me to do some of this educational work with everyone here today. So I thank you for providing this space for me to share a little bit about that. Um, so <clears throat> the wing campaign, war is not green. Um, I would say this the the way that uh, this campaign often thinks about itself and messages um, is very broadly twofold. One is we're talking about redistribution of money, right? So um, and this is in tandem with things like the cut the Pent Pentagon campaign. Um, but uh, I'm sure most people on this call are familiar with the massive amount of money that our government and our taxpayers put into US militarism and US aggression abroad. Um, the most recent budget for 2023, I think about $853 billion has been approved for the Pentagon. Um, and almost half of that is earmarked for private military contractors like Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. So that's one factor. Um, and that's just for our military budget presently. Um, and then the other factor that we're looking at is military emissions, right? So this is something that I was shocked about a year ago to learn, and now I make sure everybody I meet knows it. The US military is the planet's biggest institutional emitter of fossil fuels. It is the biggest, dirtiest polluter on the planet. It is a greater polluter than about 50 countries combined on the planet. And if you take all the sum of all global militaries, um, that attributes about 6% of all of the emissions, all of the greenhouse gas emissions that this planet is experiencing right now and warming because of. So, of course, when you learn all this, um, you realize something that many scientists have, you know, have uttered themselves, which is we actually cannot meaningfully address the climate crisis until we meaningfully address militarism domestically and abroad, right? These things are interlinked. And if we do simply, you know, and uh put up more solar panels for example that's not going to stop the cycle of acquisition that's happening with oil abroad um, and u.s imperialism abroad the the scholar nita crawford puts it really well um this this idea of a cycle of acquisition she says that because of the u.s military we're locked in the cycle of acquisition because then you know and people have very short memories we are now at 20 years since iraq um and, and this should surprise no one, but it's continuing to happen now in Ukraine, and I can continue to explain that. But we're locked in a cycle of acquisition, says Crawford, of fossil fuels, and then the protection of that acquisition, because now we have you know, foreign assets that have become privatized and US controlled abroad. Um, and all you need to do is to look at our over 750, almost 800 military bases that the United States has around the world to understand how intent we are on protecting our fossil fuels and our interests abroad and capitalism abroad, it should be said. Um, so <clears throat> zeroing in a little bit more on the war in Ukraine specifically, um, a lot of my focus with this campaign recently has been on how the war in Ukraine has increased the production of dirty energy. Right. So um, a lot of people are familiar, uh, whether they're in the peace movement or not, with what's happened with fuel prices this last year. They shot through the roof um, and the media and uh, big oil was quick to simply point the finger and say it's because of the war in Ukraine and disrupted supply chains. And that was easy enough for them to get away with. Everybody was saying, oh, yeah, the war in Ukraine. Yeah, I'm sure things are pretty shaken up out there. 
If you look just a tiny bit further, you can see that these same corporations made record profits off the backs of consumers this last year. They were profiting off of the death and destruction in Ukraine, using this as an excuse to price gouge consumers. And the issue here is twofold. It's creating a greater dependence on fossil fuels, and it's filling the coffers of these fossil fuel giants. So they have the means, the funds, the political pull to exacerbate and to expand fossil fuel extraction globally. I mean, you see that now with uh, ConocoPhillips um, beginning the Willow Project, a, a record-breaking size uh, fossil fuel extraction project that's about to be approved by the US Department of the Interior up in Alaska, right? And um, so you see companies, uh, corporate giants using the war in Ukraine to justify increased fossil fuel um, expansion. You see that also with the expansion of the coal mine in Lutzerath, where in January, probably many of you are familiar, Greta Thunberg was arrested protesting the expansion of the Lutzerath coal mine. Um, and that same company, RWE, said the same exact thing. Germany doesn't have enough fuel because we've sanctioned Russia, so we've got to be digging more coal. Now, there are many studies that actually have shown the contrary, but it's political opportunism, pure and simple. Now, speaking of Germany, <clears throat> And, and Russia, something this campaign has also been really focused on is the Nord Stream pipelines. And this is a really interesting case study in the cost of war and also how um, fossil fuel infrastructure is being spun within this narrative. So for those of you that aren't familiar, the Nord Stream pipelines connect Russia and Germany by a fossil fuel, their um, natural gas pipeline sending gas from Russia to Germany. Um, in, September, in September of last year, they were sabotaged. They were ruptured via what was clearly intentional bombings under sea. And Western countries were quick to point the finger at Russia. There was no evidence for months. Um, and uh, there's still no official government report of who, and government is the operative word there, no official government report of who actually done it. Uh, just yet, but what actually happened in that moment was these pipelines were pressurized with methane gas, miles and miles of methane gas. In fact, about 70,000 metric tons were released into our atmosphere because of the bombing of Nord Stream. So this is a wartime operation, clandestine wartime operation that caused the single greatest release of methane gas into our atmosphere that's ever been recorded. And methane is about 80 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. So you can see you know, we could say for the moment, you know, whichever country did this doesn't care about the environment, which doesn't quite narrow things down. Um, but it's it's a it's a very literal and instant cost of the war on the climate, let alone these longer term um, effects that I've just mentioned. Um, now, I should say recently, the journalist Cy Hirsch published an article um, citing a source with inside knowledge of the operations in great detail showing how the Biden administration, Biden himself, um, covertly in June of last year, planted C4, um, C4 explosives on the Nord Stream pipelines and detonated them in September. Um, so this is Cy Hirsch's account, um, and Cy Hirsch is an incredibly reputable journalist. I mean, this is someone who broke the Milai massacre back, uh, you know, about half a century ago, Abu Ghraib as well during Iraq and the, the invasions in the Middle East. Um, and of course, the White House is denying calling it uh, total fabrication, right? So this is this is one thing that this campaign, for instance, is doing is, is following this thread all the way through Nord Stream, all of its environmental effects through to saying, well, let's call on Congress to investigate, right? If 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 they're going to fully deny Cy Hirsch's account, they need to investigate. Um, and then the other factor, too, is the opportunism, right? Nord Stream was bombed. Um, and right after Nord Stream was bombed, or actually just a little bit before, because Russia had actually just turned off the tap. They had the power to turn off the, the tap on these pipelines. So it's, it's pretty clear to many people that they didn't have reason to blow it up. Um, just before the sabotage, U.S. natural gas exports to Europe surpassed Russian natural gas exports to Europe for the first time ever, right? So there are many environmental activists that initially look at the explosion of a pipeline or sabotage or monkey wrenching and say, this is, yes, like end fossil fuels. And this is about the farthest you could come from that kind of direct action. In fact, the writer of the, the book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, said as much, right? Um, because it, all it's done is restructure the fossil fuel economy and concentrate it further in the West and specifically with American corporate giants 
who, like I said, now have the means to continue expanding fossil fuels. Um, and then just to expand a little bit on the environmental destruction um, in, in Ukraine because of the war uh, itself, I mean, you are encountering a lot of what we call scope three emissions, um, which is essentially the emissions that are directly uh, caused by the products of war, products of war, right? So um, air pollution is off the charts in the Ukraine. In fact, it's the air pollution of just this war in itself, not counting the countries of Ukraine or Russia, has matched the rate of emissions of the country, the entire country of the Netherlands throughout the war. So it's created essentially an entire nation of emissions um while it's destroying people's lives and destroying um sovereignty so um and uh additionally you know arable farmland in eastern ukraine will not be it, it won't exist the farmland will not be arable for um potentially decades to come because of the forever chemicals that are leaking um into into waters and because of explosions it's estimated about 50,000 Black Sea dolphins have washed ashore on the, on the shores of the Black Sea as a result of the war um, and explosions undersea. Um, and I just really want to come back as, as one of my last points to the question of funding, right? So we've approved this $858 billion for the war, uh, for the US Pentagon this year. Um, and just in 2022, and I believe we've just now approved a good deal more. It was a hundred billion dollars for weapons in Ukraine, right? We're funding death and destruction in Ukraine. It's not it's not money for peace. It's not money for, you know, aid or resolving the conflict. And this is this is both leaving, <clears throat> this is American taxpayer money that's leaving our system that could that could be used to actually address climate change here. You know, if you were to take half of our military budget in the United States, about 150,000 green jobs could be made just from that alone. And then we would still have, with half of that amount, a greater budget than China, Russia, Iran, all of them combined. Um, and pardon me. So the, the US has been intent for about 20 years um, in, in making sure that its military missions wouldn't be counted and to make sure this is all swept under the rug. So. Um, I'll just close with this, that the, this educational bit is, is incredibly important. I'm happy to be able to share this information with all of you. Um, and I also hope that you all will help um, continue the spread of this information. I'm gonna share a link in the chat shortly. Code Pink has produced a video about the environmental effects of the war in Ukraine. Um, it's a really great 10 point video uh, that we've shared with lots of environmental organizations. So um, I'll stop there, but thank you all so much for having me and looking forward to the conversations. Thank you, Teddy. So thorough. Bravo. Um, so uh, there you go. That's <laughs> another like take a deep breath. Uh, especially I saw a you know, note in the chat about our children who um, hope that there's a future. And um, so, you know, take two breaths, please. This is our planet. This is the mother that we love. So um, next, I want to move to um, Wei Yu, who's Code Pink's China's Not Our Enemy campaign coordinator. Wei was born in China and has lived in the United States um, to go to high school. Um, in university, she studied sociology and international studies and conducted independent research on neocolonial bias in the global north um, academia. Um, so we're very excited to have Wei as part of our team. She's a passionate anti-imperialist and um, excited about her peace building work. So Wei, if you could join us and talk about the effects of this war and China. Thank you so much, Jody. Uh, I know um, all of our friends from uh, earlier this week and also earlier this morning, just really amazing speaker. And I'm really honored to be here with you all. And uh, uh, I know a lot of our speakers touched upon uh, the ongoing war in Ukraine. And then I'm just here to talk about China, but really the war in Ukraine and the US aggression towards China have a lot of um, interactive interconnected part because as uh, the U.S. is realizing that it's not winning this proxy war that's uh, funded through means of sending weapons uh, to Ukraine, it's uh, starting to drum up aggression towards China 
and again, bring us closer to another war with a nuclear power. So as uh, we see in the last year, a lot of the um, aggression towards China, whether that's militarizing the Asia Pacific um, or uh, with this idea of competition, quote unquote competition with China, they're actually using Ukraine as an excuse to justify all of this aggression. Um, for example, um, uh, with with I'm sorry, this is like really in the early, like really early in the morning for me. So I just had a lot of coffee. So like Jody said, I should remember to just breathe a little bit. Um, with Ukraine, uh, the U.S. is see, is viewing China as an uh, enemy, as our campaign name says, and is using it as an excuse to arm and militarize the Asia Pacific as part of this uh, quote unquote deterrence policy. But really, weapons kill. Weapons don't uh, deter war. Weapons escalate war. And we see that with Taiwan, with the National Defense Authorization Act for this year's uh, promising $10 billion of arms sale to Taiwan. And as um, uh, our speakers previously testified, this amount of taxpayer money could have been spent to address the most urgent need of people, be that housing or healthcare or education at home. Um, uh, <laughs> Outside of Taiwan, in other places in the Asia Pacific, um, the U.S. is also building a military uh, infrastructures and destroying people's lives and their home. So, uh, for example, in Guam, the U.S. military is violating the sovereignty of the people of Guam because they are constructing a, a new military base and they are doing this without the consent of the people. And actually, the construction is faced has faced opposition from indigenous activists because they're building uh, military facilities on ancestral burial ground and on habitats of in, uh, endangered species. They're killing people's past by destroying important cultural artifacts and they're destroying people's future by contaminating their drinking water. Similarly, uh, in Red Hill in Hawaii, uh, the US military is also killing people with all the oil spills and similarly, in Okinawa, the U.S. military base there is also destroying their pristine environment. And the most, the most important thing to take from all of this is that the people in the Asia Pacific don't want war. They don't want the, to be dragged into a potential nuclear war, and they don't want their home to be turned into battlefield. Um, in Taiwan, the ruling party for the past two decades or so actually lost the election last year because the people of Taiwan said, we want our politicians to focus on local issues and not engage in geopolitics with the US. Um, we talked about the protest uh, in Guam as well. Um, so really this ongoing aggression with China that's resulted in militarization of Asia Pacific is hurting people and destroying the pristine environment. Um, coming back to continental U.S., we are also seeing that this exploitation of anti-China political rhetoric is leaking into our social fabrics and fueling anti-Asian hate. Um, in a study, uh, in a study about uh, from 2021, um, anti-Asian hate crime actually soared over 300 percent because of all the anti-China political rhetorics. Um, under this uh, thing called China Initiative. So a lot of academics, scholars of Chinese descent are persecuted um, with false espionage charges, charges. So they're arrested, they're detained, and sometimes they're deported and their families are torn apart and also devastated by heavy legal fees. We actually have an event coming up um, on U.S. foreign policy towards China and its effect on Asian Americans on uh, Wednesday, so two weeks away from today, um, March 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern time and 5 p.m. Pacific time. And we will talk more about this issue with uh, some other great panelists. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Um, and in addition to um, hurting the people and environment of the Asia Pacific and also Asian Americans at home. 
We also see um, going back to the interaction between the war in Ukraine and this aggression towards China um, with a peace plan that China proposed as the death and destruction in Ukraine reached uh, the one year mark on Friday. Um, so this um, 12 point proposal for a negotiated peace in Ukraine um, was first of all welcomed by Ukraine with some reservations and um, Kazakhstan, which is a country neighboring Russia, as well as the Prime Minister of U uh, of Hungary, a country neighboring Ukraine, also supported the plan. However, the Biden administration rejected it because it's just not okay to call for peace now, and also it's just um, bad for the Biden administration that this peace plan is coming from China, a country that is painting as its rival. So the uh, the warmongers in Washington really, as we can see, is willing to uh, reject a peace proposal just because they want to continue to feel to feel this hate towards China. Um, so uh, with the cost of war on China uh, already being borne by the people and environment of the Asia Pacific, by Asian Americans, and also by um, opportunities for collaboration between China and the US from negotiating peace in Ukraine and also uh, fighting the climate crisis and also addressing poverty. Um, that's um, our message of our campaign is that China is not our enemy and for people on the planet, we need cooperation and not competition. Thank you, Wei. Thank you so much. Sorry to wake you up so early. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry if I my my brain's just like like working a little chunks just because the coffee is messing me up a little bit. So <laughs> thank you all for being here and also listening to me. So um I'll just make sure that Teddy and Wei both post um in the chat um ways that you can um learn more, but they both have tons more they write and um have actions that you can be engaged in. So we were gonna hear from uh Kimbali next and he just sent me a note I, I'm gonna try to share my screen um one more time <laughs> there we go that's Kimbali saying um I think the note says my son is sick and I'm the only one home taking care so um he's to uh, to share with you um, because he's being a good dad. And so I'm celebrating him for being a great dad. And that's his three month old. So the thing that he says most important that he wants you all to know is that Africa wants dialogue. They do not want war, um, especially because of the heavy price Africa is paying for this war. The grain shipments have been affected and um, that they're, um, they're, they're, they're places, there are countries within Africa that are starving. He said that um, Zelensky wanted to um, speak to the African Union. He invited everyone in the African Union and four presidents attended. Um, that he said that the Af looking from Africa, the presidents of Africa know that this is about US hegemony. They all know that this is a US proxy war. They are not inside of the propaganda at all. Um, and many of these countries, when they saw the sanctioning of Russia, it was one of the most frightening things they ever saw because if you know you you see the sanctioning of um well first we watched it with iraq which was horrifying and then we see it with cuba we see it with venezuela we see it with iran the the sanctions are meant they say to affect the leadership but they only affect the people and when africa saw that us would be so bold as to sanction russia it was like, we're all next. And what we, we witnessed with this war, like one of the costs of this war to be very clear um, is that the world has turned against 
the United States and the West. And we've seen leaders in the EU very concerned about this because they feel that they've been dragged on the coattails of the United States into the, the mud of um, how the West is being seen right now. And now it's taken hundreds of years for the West to build up the, the reputation for so many broken promises. But in the last 20 years, the number of broken promises and the, the hypocrisy that the rest of the world can see as they're looking at the Ukraine war, the utter hypocrisy, both as they're looking at the US's war on Russia through Ukraine, and as they're looking at this drive to war in China, the hypocrisy of the reasons the United States is using um, are, are all things the United States has like quadruply been horrific at. Let's just remember that since the world World War II, they say between 20 to 30 million people have been killed by the United States. So um, when we talk about sovereignty, leaders of Latin America would like to know that the United States actually understands what sovereignty means because we now have most leaders in Africa and most leaders in Latin America who are saying no to the hegemony of the United States, are saying no to having the boot on their necks in so many ways, and are saying no to you know being in agreements where they're on the losing end all the time, which is yet another cost of war. So what Kambali said he would like you to know is that Africans are, being, are concerned about being treated like Ukraine. And no one wants to be the, the, the fodder uh, inside of a war. And we, we look at Afghanistan, talk about the cost of war. Right now in Afghanistan, uh, first of all, we've, as all wars do, we've left a very traumatized and partly destroyed country as we did with Iraq. The, the fiber of the society, the, you know, what held it together. Um, when there aren't systems in place to hold together a country, then we have, you know, gangs are created and fascism is on the rise and control is what um, people turn to both. Uh, they turn to it as a comfort in, in, the, in the space of chaos. And um, it's uh, in, a, in the space of a vacuum, violence arises. And what's arising right now in Afghanistan is um, a total disrespect for the, the need of the education of women by those in power and, um, and a literally turning away, global powers turning away from what should be an engaging with. And this is like another piece of this need for diplomacy, this need for global care instead of global violence. And that global, the, the violence is in leaving a country to its own devices instead of, you know, giving it back the money that is being held in a bank in New York in ways, through ways that could actually go to the people. Where do we start caring about the people on this planet? And as we heard from Teddy, it's like we're not caring about the planet, but we are people on a planet, on an abundant planet. And these wars, all of them, steal from all of us. Yeah. So that's my message from Kambali. And and a few minutes, hopefully, ah, Daniel is here. Yay. So um, thank you, Daniel, for coming back today. Um, I introduced you to everyone yesterday, even though you need no introduction. Um, thank you for coming back because the ultimate cost of war is a nuclear winter and you are the expert on this issue. So if you can turn on your mic and turn on your camera, we're excited to welcome you back. Can you, oh, we can't hear you. Uh, that's you. I can see myself. You there, we can hear you. I'm we not hear hearing you. anything. There we go. We can oh, hear okay. you. Okay, wait a moment. 
Are we good? Not see some. Uh, can you hear us? Not yet. Can you hear me now? Now I can see. Okay. It's all yours. You can hear, you can hear it's me. It's all now. yours, Dan. It's all yours. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm not hearing you. Well, we went through this yesterday. Jody, say just one more thing and see if I hear you. We can hear you very well. Can you yeah, hear we me? We can well? hear you, Dan. Oh, we can hear you. So uh, please make I thought this was set up. We can hear you. Well, I'm not hearing you. Um, you don't need to maybe hear that's us. not important. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Go forward. I will. We went through all this yesterday, I thought. And I will again ask my son in. But it, Try pushing the button. Can you hear me? Can you hear no. me? You just heard me for a minute I there. Yeah. You can just talk, Dan. Um, Jody, have somebody else for another five minutes. Let me get my son in and let's try this once more, okay? Let's, uh, you, you. Okay. Do it. Okay. Sorry. All right. Um, we had it earlier, darn. Um, so while we, um, isn't that a beautiful picture of Dan and Patricia? Just want to remind everyone as we talk about war and peace that, you know, I don't know if anyone saw Most Dangerous Man in America. Uh, as a producer, I'm going to be like shameless and encourage you to see it. But I think one of the important parts of the story about Dan is that it was loved. And that I think, you know, what we're talking about here, especially today, the costs of war, they are painful and, and hard to hold. And it was love that um, brought Daniel to share his secrets. Um, so may we all cultivate peace and love. It is, it is so important in this world and in this country where violence uh, it, it is invested in, that 60% um, of your tax dollars is spent. Yeah. And as Olivia said, away. the hearing, where are the hearings on peace? Hey, Dan, can you hear us? I can hear you now. That's Yay. fine. Okay. Oh, welcome back. <laughs> so, hello. <laughs> I really have no, is this pretty much the same audience that was here yesterday? Do you imagine or not? Yes. Yes. Well, then I really don't know, unfortunately, how much they did say of what I said yesterday. I'll try not to repeat myself uh, too much. <clears throat> the Let me start with the thought that the threats we've been hearing from the first day or two of this war, the use of nuclear weapons by Russia, with Putin actually sitting in one of his deep underground bunkers to make the announcement that tests were being made, which he was following, of uh, ICBMs that could reach the United States, and that that was implicit in this war as a possibility. Uh, we did not hear really a denunciation of that threat in the terms that it was a monstrous, criminal, vicious, totally immoral and insane threat. After all, it, were, it was clearly a threat of an insane action for him to uh, launch any of those weapons actually against the United States where they were intended would surely result in a nuclear winter because uh, the war plans of both sides call for hitting military targets in many, many cities. Uh, and those cities, uh, even if they weren't aiming directly at cities, as they used to do very explicitly, Leningrad, as it then was, Odessa, Kharkov, all these names have, have changed since then. But uh, the cities as such haven't changed that much, and the targets uh, still are pretty much the same, because instead of aiming at Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, are the aim at military targets in Leningrad. And with the kinds of thermonuclear weapons that they use, uh, the town would be destroyed by each of those attacks. And most of the cities have many nuclear targets and many nuclear bombs aimed at them. Moscow in the past has had a tendency, perhaps the most, of having as many as 158 nuclear 
warheads landing in Moscow. Now, that shocked even Richard Cheney when he was vice president. He said, how could that be so many? Well, there are so many military targets there where their military commanders are, many bunkers for them, deep underground for them to go, uh, many air defenses, including even anti-ballistic missile defenses, uh, military industries and command posts and so forth. So, And frankly, from the very beginning, I've known every unit wants to get a warhead on Moscow. In the old days, even planes that would have to fly one-way missions with tactical nuclear bombers would arrange to get one of their bombers uh, on Moscow as a matter of prestige, practically. This despite the fact that, a, that a, a, an attack on Moscow would not paralyze uh, their uh, response. Both sides used to proclaim that only their leader could release those bombs. That was never true, because a leader can be shot, as several of our presidents have been shot, uh, or a, a, a high explosive bomb could take out a number of leaders from one bomb. In any case, a nuclear bomb from a cruise missile with essentially no warning from a submarine uh, was capable of taking out uh, either Moscow or Washington. And the incentive to do that decapitation was always that it, it had a non-zero chance of actually paralyzing the other side's retaliation without their central command. But it was never true in either side that only the president or the secretary general could release those bombs for the very reason I've described. They were not going to allow their forces to be paralyzed by a single attack on their capital or on their main command posts, submarine posts, plane posts, and so forth. There was always on both sides, uh, perhaps a little later for the Soviets, but explicitly there too, what they called the dead hand policy, which meant, which assured that a warning would go out from Moscow or another command headquarters under attack to all the other um, missile sites and uh, bomber bases and everything else, not only releasing them from their uh, control not to launch without an executive order, but to actually, in some cases, give the order, give the code for those to release. So all you would get was an uncoordinated or somewhat uncoordinated attack, and if they can change their uh, actual targets, which we could, uh, they would now aim to be almost exclusively as cities for retaliation. So hitting Moscow had no effect except to start the war. And, um, uh, and striking first, actually, uh, when there were submarines on both sides, we had always had more of them, more reliable ones. But uh, in both sides, they had submarines that would not be destroyed by an enemy attack, certainly not by ICBMs. They couldn't find them enough to destroy a society. It does not take a thousand weapons to destroy a society. Uh, but beyond that, our plans called our plans now in 1961, which I was aware of working on the plans for the Secretary of Defense and indirectly for the President Kennedy, and learned. Uh, as a result of questions I drafted for the uh, president to give, that the uh, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Strategic Air Command planned in a U.S. preemptive strike before other sides had launched, the only kind that had any promise of reducing damage to the United States in the war, getting the other missiles before they were launched. Uh, they planned to hit, in addition to the missiles, which were very few in the Soviet Union at that time, all cities over 100,000 in population, and 80% of cities had 20,000, 25,000 population. The smoke from these cities would be in the form, would, be, would rise from what were called firestorms, a very intense fire which every nuclear weapon can cause by its huge thermonuclear fireball that would incinerate everything in a large area simultaneously, that gives you, even with incendiary weapons, an updraft, which lofts smoke far beyond its normal altitude in the atmosphere, from which it eventually rains out. Instead, it would be lofted into the stratosphere. We achieved this only three times, though we tried a hundred times in World War II, uh, on in incendiary attacks on Dresden, Hamburg and Tokyo. In Tokyo, we killed about 100,000 people 
80 to 120,000 people in one night, dying very badly, actually, uh, boiling to death in canals they sought for shelter from the fire, which were boiling. Tens of thousands of people died like that. Others died by fire, which is not a good way to die. And as anyone who's been in combat, as I have in Vietnam, uh, and any civilian uh, facing death knows there are better and worse ways to die, very, very much so. And uh, death by fire is one of the very worst quick ones. The uh, <clears throat> certainly morally not really distinct from bringing, uh, bringing people to gas chambers. This brings an end the bodies to the fire. This brings the fire to the people, the furnaces to the people. Now, we've had then, at the time, the expectation of killing, uh, I'll go to the details now, I just said yesterday, it's in my book, Doomsday Machine, in the very first pages, that they expected to kill 600 million people with our first strike, not a strike out of the blue, but what we called preemption, a strike in anticipation that the other side would strike. And the reason you're doing that in the face of what you think is the inevitability of war, in some way, is the delusion which had elements of reality long in the past when the flight, when the war was mainly conducted by slow, by flyers, by planes, which could take 10 and 12 hours to reach their targets after they've been set out, and which could be defended against by, in various forms, anti-aircraft fire, surface air missiles. It was a possible defense against that. But into the age of uh, missiles, where there really is no defense, uh, we spent billions, many billions, on ABM, anti-ballistic missile defenses, but the possibility, the easy possibility of accompanying every warhead with 50 to 100 decoys, which sensors can't distinguish from the warhead, means that the chance of actually destroying a warhead is almost nil. So it's a total hoax, the uh, notion, the money we've spent on that over the years and are still spending. But we also spent trillions on a much more plausible and very profitable hoax, which was that you could lower damage to the United States in, uh, even in general war, if you went first. And if you had uh, weapons that could not only go very quickly on command, and the communications to ICBM permit that on the ground much more than to uh, submarines at sea, where you, the communication can be had, but it's <clears throat> not as fast, not as reliable. So the ICBMs offer themselves with large warheads, not needed for destroying urban areas, though they are often aimed at those, but are essential at those days for destroying a hardened missile, a, hot, a missile in a concrete silo that uh, had to be hit quite close by in order to be described. In those days, Polaris nuclear submarines couldn't do that. They could basically only hit soft targets like cities and airfields. But so the Air Force said, we've got something now that keeps our strategic air command of bombers and missiles alive compared to the submarine, which seems to be a more uh, a better deterrent force. You can't find it. Uh, it's out at sea. It's essentially invulnerable. And the ICBM, on the contrary, became more and more vulnerable as accuracy of missiles improved on both sides. So it came down from a range of miles uh, within the target, uh, miles from the target that you could have 50% of the missiles fall within, to hundreds of yards, and even less than that, tens of yards. So that even with a smaller charge that you could fit many of them on top of a missile uh, and release them separately, each one of those could land close enough to a missile to destroy it. So he had the chance to take their ice, each side had the chance to take their missiles off the board. Whatever else they threw at you, it wouldn't be those in initially thousand or several thousand with multiple warheads. Uh, it, it would be only the submarines and the missiles you had missed, which would be a, a significant fraction. Only a fraction of that will destroy your society. But surely it's not as bad to uh, uh, be struck by their SLBMs. Not as bad 
uh, for uh, to be struck by a fraction of their eye sequence, then all of it. Isn't that obvious? Well, it's obvious, but it's wrong. Uh, in the first instance, it doesn't take that many arriving warheads on cities to destroy a society. It doesn't take a thousand cities or 500 cities. It doesn't take a hundred cities. Uh, 10 cities, major cities, uh, five, 10, uh, 20, certainly, uh, the society is not a functioning society in any sense that it was before. But more than that, and that you couldn't you couldn't avoid. You, in a war between the U.S. and Russia, you can't get things down lower than that. Even though, even though with those effects, people outside the explosion area, uh, in, <laughs> in what Herman Kahn called Area B, uh, which was outside the cities and where a lot of the population was, could, if they prepared very carefully with fallout shelters and, shelter, and food and everything which Herman Kahn proposed, uh, could perhaps last quite a while from the fallout. So you'd have a lot of people left, even without transportation hubs, hospitals, doctors, transportation, communication hubs, any of that. But uh, you'd have, let's say, a rural society with a lot left. Except that 20 years after I'd looked on the plans in 1961, in 1983, an international group of scientists, including some Russians on Stenchikov, and American scientists like Carl Sagan, others like Brian Toon um, and Turco, a number of others, discovered and calculated that burning the cities and jump and throwing what what is now proven to be pretty much to be 150 million tons of soot and black smoke into this into the stratosphere would blot out the sunlight to the extent of 70 percent freeze rivers freeze ponds uh even in the summer certainly in the spring and kill all harvests worldwide before this discovery uh, when you destroyed the northern hemisphere where almost all the targets exist on uh, eurasia and the U.S., North America, you have a southern hemisphere where the radioactive fission products don't generally penetrate in the stratosphere or even the atmosphere to the southern hemisphere because um, equatorial winds blow away from the equator and with no warheads, the southern hemisphere would be a spare hemisphere when you destroyed the northern hemisphere. That's not true. The smoke in the stratosphere is not stopped by equatorial winds. It goes around the globe very quickly, destroys harvests almost as much in the southern hemisphere. There's a little difference uh, than in the northern. There would be people surviving. It probably would not be extinction. Some have calculated 96% extinction, 98%. Well, 1% is 80 million people uh, nowadays. Uh, and uh, then it was 30 million people. 2%, uh, even more. 10% might survive. 800 million people, quite comparable to the population of the world uh, in the 1800, which was a billion. But they wouldn't be where they were before. It wouldn't be in the Northern Hemisphere. There would be, Ellen Roebuck tells me, people in Argentina and uh, parts of Australia, <clears throat> seacoasts of New Zealand, people living on mollusks and seafood. And uh, so we could do it all again. There'd be enough people to inherit this technology and uh, have wars and uh, other civilized uh, accomplishments. But uh, most people would be gone, and they would be gone through starvation in the course of a year, which, like fire, is not one of the better ways to die, watching your children and older people starve before your eyes in the course of a year is uh, is not, as General Grove said of radiation, wrongly, a pleasant way to die. He was wrong. It's That isn't either. So um, here we are then, uh, having a leader of a major state say, not for the first time, uh, but one of the first against us, actually, that he would initiate uh, a nuclear war, presumably in the form of a small nuclear war, tactical nuclear weapons, uh, many of which are the size of Hiroshima, 13 kilotons, kilotons uh, some what are called tactical nuclear weapons, 10, even 5 kilotons, half a Hiroshima or a third of a Hiroshima. 
And we even have bombs that we're sending to Europe that can be dialed down from hundreds of kilotons. A kiloton is a thousand tons of TNT equivalent. So you can even have what was not conceivable uh, 20 or 30 years ago, a third of a kiloton, 300 tons only, which sounds either large or small to you. It's very small compared to what destroyed Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Nagasaki was 20,000 tons, Hiroshima 13, 15,000. But uh, on the other hand, comparing it to blockbusters of World War II, which could destroy a city block, those were 5, 10, and 15, at the most, 20 tons. So 300 tons is a big bang, uh, usable on a battlefield. Uh, on a city, it would, it would uh, make a hole, a very distinct hole, uh, and would seem usable. It's in the same realm as ordinary war, the trouble being that the moment that one side or the other, and in this case, it would be almost certainly the Russians who use the nuclear weapon, and that is because a tactical nuclear weapon, because nowadays where Putin is fighting, the NATO countries have an enormous conventional non-nuclear superiority to the Russians. That's a reversal of the situation when NATO was conceived for started. At that time, the Russians were imagined to have an enormous conventional superiority after World War II. And that was a considerable myth, but it had reality. Uh, it was very greatly exaggerated uh, by exaggerating the size, uh, by uh, realizing that when we talked about 175 Russian divisions, which was the conventional uh, attribution to the Russians, it took quite a while for people to uh, absorb the fact that a Russian that more than half of those divisions were paper divisions, which didn't even exist. Other others were just command post decisions, which were to be filled out with soldiers as they're mobilizing right now <clears throat> uh, in time of war, not not available for a butt screen. And the uh, size of the Russian division was less than half of the size we of, a, of American division. Uh, in other words, uh, 75 divisions did not mean 75 US divisions, more else there were also matters of manning and so forth. So the, the possibility of a conventional offense against Russia was always there in terms of the economies of Europe. Uh, in fact, little known fact and carefully concealed fact was the NATO companies countries together had more manpower under arms than the Warsaw Pact. Far from being this David facing Goliath with a nuclear sling, uh, they were they were pretty evenly matched, although the NATO countries were distributed in their area. They weren't based for best defense against a Russian offensive. But the time at that thought was we can only protect West Berlin inside East Europe, inside East Germany. Uh, we, we can't defend it in, at all with a conventional defense. They had 22 tank divisions in the vicinity of Berlin and in East Germany. <clears throat> we, we could not have uh, challenged that with our own tanks. So we challenged it with a commitment that we would launch, under Eisenhower, all-out war, Moscow, Leningrad, everything, if they penetrated East Berlin, which was held at that time for power uh, <clears throat> after, the, after World War II. Kennedy modified that when I was working for him uh, and said, we'll have a flexible response. And the idea was at first, he would launch one or two weapons to demonstrate resolve. We're ready to use nuclear weapons, which we've been threatening now for a decade under Eisenhower. But you'll see that uh, it's not just a bluff. We'll use one in hopes that the war will stay one-sided because of Russian fear that if they joined it, we might strike them first with our overwhelming superiority in preemptive capability. And if they didn't, if they responded, we could escalate. But at some point before long, we would we would go first. And that would keep them. That was the defense of Berlin for over half a century. Uh, it meant it was not certain to succeed. Uh, Kennedy in particular and Eisenhower before him were far from certain that these threats would keep Russia from walking in 
to uh, a, a city that they surrounded with East German and East German divisions. But it was hoped that it would succeed, and it did, by the way. It did hold Berlin. The price of that was, though, legitimizing the idea, essentially, of starting a conflict that would blow up Eurasia and Europe. We didn't know about nuclear winter then. The reality was that that conflict would have destroyed most life on Earth, and we would not be having this discussion now. But that was regarded as legitimate. The uh, had a reason um, to save West Berlin from being socialized. Uh, it had um, um, capabilities that were adapted to that, to hit Russian ICBMs uh, in great numbers. This was a very profitable hoax uh, by the aerospace industry that it was possible to limit damage in an all-out nuclear war, depending what you targeted and what your vehicles were, how accurate they were. That was all false. It was all false ever when it came to re uh, preserving a, re a society uh, in the course of a two-sided nuclear war. As Reagan and Gorbachev recognized, nuclear war cannot be won. They said it must be false. Well, that's a little misleading. The only nuclear war that was ever fought was one. In 1945, we sent two weapons to a non-nuclear nation. We had a monopoly. There was no chance of response. And whether or not they won the war, and I would say absolutely not, that's a myth, but a widely accepted myth, uh, they didn't lose the war. Most of our threats, our threats, have been against non-nuclear powers that had a nuclear ally, as in Indochina, which eventually uh, China came to be a nuclear power, and Russia was all supported, supported North Vietnam about the way that uh, we're supporting Ukraine now. But they didn't get directly into it. And we didn't win that war, but it didn't go nuclear, uh, even though we made nuclear threats. <clears throat> the and, but a, a nuclear threat directly against Russia, the same, by the way, occurred in Korea and uh, actually uh, Iraq and Kuwait, uh, places you haven't heard of in that connection problem. <laughs> a lot of these threats were secret, uh, even in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I meant to say Iran, uh, secret threats. But they were, in a sense, or they weren't necessary. We haven't actually seen a nuclear war, which is very reassuring, given how many threats there have been, like Putin's now, except, now let me go right to Ukraine, except there are some peculiar and ominous aspects of this confrontation. Both Russia and the US, which have each of whom have destroyed, the ability to destroy not just each other and not just their allies, but most life in the world, that is the threat they, they render in fighting themselves. No warheads outside their own territories, but fallout and smoke does not respect territories. And the smoke goes around the world. So every person in the world, every nation in the world has a stake, and I would say a right to have a say and some influence in the occurrence or the plans to start a nuclear war uh, between the U.S. and Russia, above all, which can not be won, that's true, and uh, which will affect everybody with the smoke. We're, we're defending this area or that area, India and Pakistan defending each other in ways that could cause a billion to two billion deaths by famine if India and Pakistan alone were to launch just a fraction of their existing small inventories. A uh, hundred weapons altogether, fission weapons, Hiroshima, would cause death by starvation of 100 to 200 million. Does India, either India or Pakistan have the right in their own defense to cause that breadth of death around the country? It would seem obviously not. But almost no one has raised that. And there is a reason. No one has raised it for Russia. Does Russia have a right? to threaten something against what would quickly be, almost surely be a U.S.-NATO war with nuclear war with Putin, to launch that almost surely 
guaranteeing the death of most people in the world, 90 to 90, 90 to 98% of people in the world. What right do they have to do that? Is that not, as I suggested at the beginning, a monstrous threat, immoral, insane? And we don't hear those words. Uh, either against Russia or against India or Pakistan. India says has it has a uh, no first use case having a uh, non notional uh, nuclear superiority to Pakistan, but Pakistan is fairly explicit about uh, in, using mm -hmm. nuclear weapons first if they had to, and they assume that in a war with India they would have to. Okay, so why haven't we heard this denunciation? All we heard is you will regret it. Uh, you'll you'll have consequences if you do this. We don't spell them out. It's not easy to define them uh, compared to nuclear explosion. But we'll do something at first non-nuclear, which will make you regret that you did this and stop it. Uh, negotiation. What we haven't heard was the very idea of this happening and we're, we're imposing consequences so forth is absolutely intolerable and wrong. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that the U.S., as I've indicated already, has been making comparable threats for 70 years and still does and rejects the notion brought up by some of their own Congress people, but I mean, by many allies, of a no use, no first use threat. Because there are situations no longer in Europe for us, but say in Taiwan, uh, 100 miles from mainland China, uh, where China has a regional conventional parity, at least, maybe even superiority. And I, I'm, I'm afraid, sorry to say that I don't see Biden, who feels a responsibility for protecting Taiwan and deterring an attack from giving up that deterrent. We might initiate worldwide nuclear war to defend Taiwan. Now, that threat should never have happened. But on the other hand, it always was risking world destruction. But on the other hand, one could say it has worked. And we haven't had it. It's working right now. The weapons are being used in the way you point them at somebody in a conflict and you get their way without pulling the trigger. Putin made his threats clearly in February 20, late, late February, a year ago, to keep NATO, uh, which wasn't obliged to come to the defense, of uh, Ukraine because it wasn't a member, but to keep any UK uh, NATO member above all the US from participating directly in that war. Uh, Biden's unique claim, we will not send troops, no matter how much they might help or be needed, we will not send troops, is a reflection of the use, the successful use of Putin's nuclear threats because that would have too much of a threat of blowing the world up. For his side, Putin is not attacking bases in Poland, uh, in NATO territory or Romania, which would be very natural targets, on, except for the threat that the nuclear, that that could respect, uh, go to a nuclear war. Now, each of the superpowers, US and Russia, with its doomsday capability, has actually allowed itself to be defeated or stalemated and a compromise negotiated solution arrives in a number of wars. And that wasn't predicted when we came into this, when I was working on this in the 50s. It was assumed that any war between uh, uh, the, involving a nuclear state, any nuclear state, could not be lost without their going nuclear. We found that they were willing, as Russia was willing to lose to Afghanistan, the U.S. was willing to lose to Afghanistan. Uh, we had a stalemate in Korea, both sides. We lost in Vietnam without using nuclear weapons. Doesn't that tell us that there's really minimal risk? The problem is, as I see it, that neither power has faced the prospect of losing a war to the other superpower. It's one thing to draw out of a war where you're, the adversary is obviously inferior, can't threaten you, it just costs too much, it's not worth it, it's not enough interest, and you decide to get out of that war. But when you're claiming 
that you are at parity or superiority with a nuclear superpower, very dangerous politically and in running an empire to lose that war to another peer superpower. And we we are not facing that yet at this moment. We have a stalemated war, but I'll be very specific now. Putin has made it clear over and over in the last year and before it that he regards like almost every Russian, Crimea as Russian, as part of Russia. And that loss of Crimea and the Black Sea base, the base for the Black Sea fleet, which which they've had for a very long time, the loss of that would be a loss of Russia and a tremendous political challenge to Putin at home. And if he were replaced by another, it would be someone who would be tougher on that issue. It's entirely credible. They will use every means they have, including nuclear, to keep from losing Crimea. To a slightly lesser extent, that extends to the Donbass, which has been the eastern part of which has been occupied by Russia and has now been proclaimed as Russia. That losing that would be Russia. Uh, actually, they only controlled a third of it to begin with. Somewhat more now, uh, more like a half. There's still parts of the Donbass they don't actually occupy that, though they've claimed it as part of Russia. What I'm saying is, I think it's quite credible that if they're actually faced with the loss of Crimea, which Zelensky, as head of the Ukrainian state, promises and is acting toward right now, I think actually without the in- intervention of Americans directly not just planes, but American pilots and uh, and even ground troops. Russia, this is just a guess now, does not, will not have this fatal fate of either losing Crimea or using nuclear weapons. But if the Americans did what Zelensky has called for from the beginning, Hillary Clinton called for it in a no-fly zone that would involve directly hitting at Russian troops with American troops, something that has never happened, except for the shoot down overtly of Major Anderson in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which brought it to a head. But since 1919, Russians and Americans have at times been allies in the Second World War, but have never shot at each other. And many people are calling for that to change now, uh, and to uh, be shooting each other, giving the possibility of each one losing to the other, something I think neither side is going to be willing to do for domestic, no president is going to be, allow himself to be accused of losing a war to, to Russia that he's been directly fighting. There hasn't been one, but there could be one now. So right now, I'll end by saying, can we people of the world, all of us have a stake, I would say, in averting this a nuclear war And that is likely to arise in the first instance, and it is possible to arise, by an escalation of American involvement up to including um, actual U.S. participation, which lies, I think, a a step or two beyond giving the F-16s, which uh, in a lot of of time, which uh, the planes, Biden is, I think, rightly still refraining from doing that. But uh, the pressure to do that I will not be in the next month or two. I don't think they will fight it. But as each side realizes an inescapable stalemate after their offensives have failed this fall, either they will negotiate on a compromise solution of the kind that they, uh, Zelensky and Putin, had arrived at in, Tur- in Istanbul in a year ago in March and April, which essentially was a return to the pre-19 February 24th situation with uh, uh, autonomy for the Crimea and the Donbass, Ukraine definitely out of NATO, Russian troops having returned uh, to their earlier positions at least. Um, no uh, long range weapons uh, aimed at the on the borders of the other. It was then that Boris Johnson of Britain and the president behind him said to Zelensky, we will not accept such a compromise or any compromise at this point. The war must go on. I think two things, to weaken Russia, they said, which is very questionable, to define 
Russia inevitably, irrevocably, as an enemy for the purposes of the unity of NATO, uh, the U.S. predominant role in NATO, uh, avoiding a, US, a, a German Russian rapprochement, uh, trading gas, which we have currently blocked. And I suspect uh, Sarhurst is right by our deliberately blowing up parts of the Nord Stream 2 that hasn't been proven, but it's plausible. Um, we didn't want the European home that Gorbachev talked about from Lisbon to Vladivostok, because in that role, there was no protectorate role for the US. No reason for nuclear threats, which we supply. No reason for US troops in Europe. No reason for NATO at all. What the mafia calls our thing, Cosa Nostra, our thing. NATO is our Cosa Nostra. It was about to go out of relevance. That won't happen now. That's been achieved. What the world can say as one, outside Ukraine perhaps, there must be any any threat to initiate nuclear war in the world by anyone. In Europe, they could start with European powers, but really anywhere in the world, by anyone, anywhere, under any circumstances, for any alleged reasons, is immoral and insane. Not only, yes, it is also unprecedentedly imprudent. What do you say? We have no words to describe destroying most life on earth, omnicide, killing most, multigenocide. Uh, imprudent uh, seems pretty weak. But it's not only that. Uh, there is a moral aspect to this that has just not been talked about. And I would hope has the possibility in this situation of telling people, uh, we want this war ended. Uh, Ukrainians may see it worth the risk, even of nuclear war, to get every Russian out of Crimea and out of the Donbass. But that effort is against the interests of every other country on Earth because it confronts them with an intolerable risk of dying themselves. So they have the right and the, and the obligation, I would say, to demand that this, this war, with its uh, possibilities of leading to a nuclear war, in this instance started by Russia, rather than to uh, achieve or turn the aims that Zelensky has openly aimed at, regaining the Crimea, regaining the Donbass totally, uh, is itself an obscene, immoral, insane objective. And I think I would like the people of the world to force this recognition on their leaders who in their moral blindness and moral cowardice uh, fear losing uh, such a conflict or losing part of their own territory and uh, assert our own human interest in keeping life going on earth. This may be the time, now that for once we're facing down the barrel of nuclear threats from a bad guy, as we see it, an, an aggressor, definitely an aggressor, Putin, uh, rather than the good guys, the US, who are just as much of an aggressor in Iraq, but did not suffer sanctions uh, or condemnation, uh, let alone actually armed resistance in our full-scale aggression of Iraq, as aggressive and immoral as what Putin is doing in Cuba. Now, some would argue even more so because we've never claimed that Iraq is part of the US and Russian people unfortunately do accept uh, the notion that uh, they are entitled to do this even in Ukraine. Well, that's a terrible moral uh, framework. But uh, we don't have to accept that. And at the same time, we can accept the fervor of their conviction and what may, what may rest on it. So we have a role to play and uh, maybe for all time to make people realize that the use of nuclear weapons anywhere and the threat of it and preparation of it to carry it out 
and the risk of it is, I say once again, immoral and insane. Okay, shall I leave it there? Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, moral and insane is the only way to describe the dangers that we're in with nuclear war. So I just want to thank you for your presentation and uh, doubly so because uh, you're uh, now facing some serious health issues. And yet, despite that, uh, you've chosen to come on uh, this program. So I just want to acknowledge uh, you as a world treasure and a real paragon of the kind of courage and integrity and truth telling uh, that is required uh, for genuine social movement uh, to take place. Uh, and uh, so I just want to acknowledge uh, how you've presenced yourself uh, in the world since the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and uh, it's been such an extraordinary inspiration to so, so many of us. Um, I know we're significantly over time, but I want to just uh, ask you just a, a couple of questions. One is, one of the factors in the situation in Ukraine and also with China is that there are no more nuclear guardrails. And uh, I would love to have you comment on that because starting with the 1963 nuclear test ban treaty that the United States and the Soviet Union uh, agreed on in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we built up a whole series of treaties and protocols that limited nuclear war uh, weapons, that el eliminated uh, medium range from Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, since uh, George Bush Jr. onwards, they've been systematically dismantled largely by the United States, uh, leaving only the START uh, uh, treaty uh, that uh, two weeks ago Putin uh, 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 indicated that they would uh, no longer honor, uh, so that the dangers are actually doubled in the sense that it's not only the nuclear conflict between the superpowers, as you're saying, that's unique with Ukraine, but this is happening without any nuclear guardrails, uh, essentially, that are left. Okay. You're right about the supposed guardrails being killed. I think very few people realize how unconfining those guardrails were. <laughs> in permitting 1,550 uh, alert warheads, now either at sea or you know, on the air, by each side, with several thousand in reserve, the effect that would have made on a nuclear war that happened Actually, at first, it wouldn't affect the likelihood of a nuclear war, I would say. I'll just say that without arguing it. Second, if the war occurred, uh, it was just as likely to occur, and the effect would be indistinguishable mm -hmm. from having 20,000 weapons on each side in 1550. They say with nuclear winter, which the Pentagon refuses to, organize, to recognize because it means that they're trillion dollar efforts to preempt are meaningless, will have no effect. Well, I would say by the same token, going down from 80, 67,000, 70,000 weapons in the world to 15,000 seems like a great achievement. How, how can it not be? It isn't. It didn't affect the likelihood of war. The ICBMs are still there, vulnerable, pointed at each other. And the effects of a thousand weapon war are indistinguishable from the effects of a 20,000. So on the first hand, these were to a large extent mythical just to reassure people. Now, they were reassuring to the point it meant we were talking to each other, we were treating each other as somebody who could affect, be affected by treaties. Someday we might have arrived at a treaty that would actually affect the likelihood of war um, and, and the scale of war. To do that, you'd have to get weapons down to or below the levels of other countries, not 15, not 3,000 each, but 100 each or even lower. Only North Korea, as, we, as far as we know, does not have the power 
to cause a nuclear winter that would kill at least a billion. We don't have a legitimate reason for having any less, any more than North Korea or England or France. Now, there's something you could aim at, a submarine at sea, two submarines at sea, perfectly adequate for defense against nuclear attack, deterrence of nuclear attack. Uh, you know, one tritons instead of 14 uh, and so forth. So the fact, I don't think the past agreements have really done much uh, to do it, and the loss of them doesn't do much either. We're on a freeway to hell where the guardrails are way off in the desert on each side. They, they really don't have much effect. And getting rid of them is a bad sign because it's part of not talking at all and not paying any attention even to pretend to lower nuclear war. So the trend is indeed very ominous. The actual effects are the situation remains is as dangerous as it was before. Can I come back in just a couple of minutes? I'd, ha I'd like to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if uh, any of the other panelists are still with us, Teddy, Savina, uh, Wei, uh, Jody, please join. Uh, we'll wrap it up uh, uh, soon. I know some of them had uh, some uh, constraints. Oh, there's Teddy. Uh, good, Teddy. Jody. As we're waiting for Dan, uh, Teddy, is there anything you want to uh, add to what Dan said or the general conversation? Sure. I mean, I mean, I, I should almost go without saying that from the perspective of my campaign, war is not green. I mean, the we're looking at two ultimate catastrophic consequences of, of war on the environment. One is climate change, which is more protracted and harder to place our finger on the pulse of, but we're, we're trying our best and hoping to raise awareness of that. And, and in many ways, that, that youth movement around climate change, I think, is, is mirroring a lot of the anti-nuclear um, movement and the development of that um, during the Cold War. And then, of course, we have the continued threat of nuclear war, which, Dan has, uh, which Daniel has had um, done a really wonderful and troubling <laughs> job of laying out for us. Um, it would take, I, I believe, as 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 he laid out for us, it would take such a small. I think maybe it's 0.5 percent of the global nuclear arsenal to displace uh, about two billion people on the planet, and that's just 0.5 percent. I mean, if we were to start an all-out nuclear war, um, and even just a fraction more were to be engaged, I mean, we are looking at planetary extinction, not just for ourselves, but for more than human uh, kin on this planet. So, I mean, this this is, you know, one of those things that I, I almost feel that, um, it, you know, maybe each generation has sort of their something that calls them to act um, in some ways. And, and there's lots of overlap. I mean, you see that with the Fridays for Future movement, lots of youth activism around climate change. Um, and then with this campaign, you know, it, it's it's really important for, for me and, and for people like me at the intersection of, of, of peace and climate to say, well, we didn't deal with, we, we haven't dealt with the threat of nuclear war. In fact, it continues to be uh, greater than ever as, you know, as we're looking at the bulletin of, of atomic scientists and, and moving closer to midnight. And so continuing to frame this as an environmental issue, you know, even if that fraction of nuclear weapons were to, were to be dropped, I mean, it would be catastrophic on, on global environments if it didn't reach, as Dan laid out, that total extinction level. So, I mean, that, that threat is ever present and making sure that it's present in our conversations around climate change, I think is absolutely crucial. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll uh, do the following way. Why don't we get a final statement from you and then Dan and then uh, Jody, why don't you wrap it up uh, for today? But this has been a marvelous uh, conversation on the costs of war and in particular the nuclear danger. So thank you all. Wei, want to make uh, any additional comments? Um, I just want to thank everyone again for um, all of your patience with me as I'm finally going down this caffeine high. Uh, I <laughs> We all know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just um, our campaign, China's Not Our Enemy, um, is really to um, disrupt 
um, the ongoing aggression towards China. And we want all of our messages to be um, loving and really beautiful and really disarming. And just to quickly add to uh, the point of a nuclear war, um, we all want to act with a sense of urgency because we are um, currently uh, at at, like there is a war with uh, with Russia going on in Ukraine, and then now with the uh, driving hate towards China, we are risking another war. Um, I will say there is a a distinction with China is that China is the only nuclear power that has an absolute no first use policy. Uh, so China absolutely in no uh circumstances has promised to not use nuclear weapons, uh, not be the first to use nuclear weapons, and will never use nuclear weapons on a non-nuclear power. Um, so although we want people to act with the urgency that we are uh, getting closer to a nuclear war, we also want to make sure that our message is disarming, that we are focusing on the aggressor um, who is trying, the U.S. who is trying to maintain a hegemonic power by painting China as dangerous. This is my one thing. Yeah, Wei, that's a really important point about China. It's the one major power that's been very clear that it won't go to first strike as a matter of policy, uh, who who knows what they'll actually do as a matter of practice, but they have uh, a very specific uh, prohibition on first strike. Uh, and I also want to say that because of this blending of, of Russia and China as enemies uh, for the United States in our next summit uh, on the 24th and the 28th of April, We'll be talking a lot more about China, but we wanted Wei to come in, uh, even though the focus overwhelmingly is on Ukraine uh, for this week. Uh, China is looming as an increasingly uh, critical issue, and the fact that China and Russia are aligning the way they are with the support of most of the global South. As Jody said at the beginning, uh, this is uh, this is an unprecedented amalgamation. Of, of nations in a coalition that are really finally taking on the United States in a systematic and coherent way. Uh, so we'll be having Wei uh, back and many of her colleagues uh, in our next summit. So Dan, um, we're wrapping up. Why don't you just give us one final uh, word that you would like to leave us with uh, as we uh, bring this particular session to a close? Well for many decades, I've been saying that of all the nuclear armed states in the world, only China had a relatively sane policy. You know, we used to have this movement called sane nuclear policy, but I don't think they ever defined really what they saw as a sane policy. Well, China had, a, had and has a minimum deterrence. The weapons are only for deterring nuclear attack on them, uh, not on other people, uh, which means that they do not had not built up the ability to deter, I'm sorry, to disarm any adversary like the West. And uh, without that objective uh, or claim, uh, they felt always that a, a dozen or a couple dozen ICBMs that could reach us were enough in compared to our thousands of warheads. Unfortunately, they are moving away from that it remains to be seen how much, but in a way that allows our hawks to say, well, they have more weapons than we do now, or they will have. It's it's a totally spurious argument that gives them something to say. The I am saying that to focus on this issue of, of uh, first use, I think, is very practical and has a chance actually of being achieved in this case, with precisely with the fears that uh, Putin has focused our minds on at last. And I would like to see countries outside the United States uh, at la in NATO at last withdrawing, not necessarily from NATO, but withdrawing from the threat or, the, or legitimating the threat, condemning the threat that NATO has long based its policy on to initiate nuclear war if necessary and saying there is no necessary no necessity that justifies nuclear war and even if the u.s is very reluctant and will be to make that statement oddly vice president biden said he thought so no reason for first use and now as president he was campaigning on a promise to say no first use and as president totally 
backed off from that, from his uh, his uh, obligations as he sees them to China. Well, that issue you'll be discussing is a serious one. It does not justify preparing to blow up the world. And that is also true for Russia and China, defending Crimea and the Donbass from uh, being overrun, which would probably uh, involve or succeed a U.S. direct involvement, which must be avoided, I believe. Uh, we need to see people saying that threat has always been monstrous. Problem here that the U.S. has been making it all this time, but that now no nation, including the U.S. or anybody else, has the right and should be, and they should be showing that in practice. Last point, by removing from Europe weapons that are only for first use, what are they? Weapons that could not survive a Russian attack, either conventional or nuclear, and that means every F-35 in Europe. They are nothing but first use with their nuclear capability being acquired by others. American weapons should not be in Europe where they are only for first use, can be easily destroyed, withdrawn back to the U.S. And uh, NATO should move in the direction of uh, becoming a non-nuclear uh, alliance, which will improve its security, not reduce it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Again, we salute your life and we salute your courage. We salute everything that you've done for the cause of peace. It's been one of the uh, the pillars of our time. So thank By you. By the way, Jim, you, you worked so long for the man that we so need, the world so needs a Gorbachev. Oh. And uh, can hardly, they, they don't come very often, as you know better than anyone know, knowing Gorbachev. Uh, my dream, by the way, was that if he'd stayed in power a little longer, uh, which was a possibility, it seemed like, for just my steps, stop that, including the coup attempt. But if he'd been in longer, my dream was, a, a, a practical dream, was that Gorbachev would extend his glasnost policy, his openness to his nuclear planning. And that of everybody throw open the safe. He absolutely hadn't created these plans. He didn't have responsibility for them initially and say, these are insane, which they are. And then say, I imagine that your plans, uh, not only in the US, but even on a small scale in Britain and France and elsewhere are equally insane. Let's see them. Let's see them for the first time have horrors. And I could see Gorbachev doing that. Oh, but uh, unfortunately, he didn't keep the power to do it. And we have seen no other Gorbachev in the world since him. <laughs> it was a great privilege of my life uh, to uh, get to know him and uh, actually be the last foreigner that he received in his Kremlin office and then work with him for 10 years, uh, convening uh, conversations that matter and transforming them into actions that made a difference. Uh, it was an extraordinary man. Uh, and I would just add, uh, before turning it back over to you, Jody, I would just add that his action was unprecedented in modern history. And let's just take a moment to take in the grandeur of Gorbachev. Here he comes in, in a totalitarian system that had stood uh, for 50 years, the Soviet Union, He's challenged by the United States and NATO. He understands intuitively, as Dan was just saying, that this was insane. He says to President Reagan first, and then the President Bush Sr., Maggie Thatcher, Helmut Kohl, the leadership of the West, we need to end this. And somebody has to make the first move. The Soviet Union is willing to make the first move and withdraw all its troops from Eastern Europe and allow Germany to be reunited. We all need to take in what that meant. It's unprecedented. There's no historical example that I know about 
where an empire voluntarily and peacefully and nonviolently withdrew from major territory, all of Eastern Europe, and then allowed the country that had attacked them in World War II, leaving well over 20 million people dead to be reunited. And the only thing that he asked for is for NATO not to move to the east. And he did it in good faith. And in 1990, he withdrew. The Warsaw Treaty Organization was disbanded. Unfortunately, he and the Soviet Union, it fell away at the end of 1991. And the neocons felt that they could seize the moment. And instead of creating the peace from Lisbon to Vladivostok that Gorbachev had envisioned, break down Russia, attack, expand NATO to the east. And it was that violation of that agreement that has led now to what's happening in Ukraine. But Dan is absolutely right. For a brief shining moment, like we did, we had with Kennedy in the generation before, we had someone rise to the pinnacle of power that actually carried a passion for peace. And uh, it was my honor to work with him all those years. Uh, and uh, 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 Dan was part of those State of the World Forum uh, convenings that we had and, and many, many others. Uh, and that was a path, uh, unfortunately, not taken. And here we are uh, in Ukraine, an escalating conflict with the possibility of nuclear exchange. Choices matter in history. They really, really do. And uh, so thank you, Dan. And now, Jody, why don't you uh, close us out with whatever statement you would like to make, and then we'll meet all again tomorrow. I don't know if I could say anything more than thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Wei. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you for holding this space for us all to be deeply grounded in the love and the peace that we desire. It's, it's super important. So thank you. And we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, Dan, Way, Savina, Teddy. Marvelous session today. We've looked reality right in the eye. And we did it with deep compassion uh, with some very great souls. So thank you all. You're all welcome to the after session chat group. You'll see the link in the chat. And we'll see you all again tomorrow uh, for our fourth of five days on the conflict in Ukraine. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.